where you should try to learn as many different things as possible. And I, I truly think that is the reason that today I'm a CEO. Hey everyone, this is Nazar Akil from Max Pro. Hi, I'm Linda. And I'm Paul. And we're Love and Pebbles. Hi, this is Lopa Vandermersch from Rasa. Oh, and you're listening. And you're listening. And you are listening to, to the Arm Show. Show. Welcome to the Ecom Show, presented by Blue Tusker, the number one place to hear the inside scoop from other e-commerce experts, where they share their secrets on how they scaled their business and are now living the dream. Now, here is your host, Andrew Math. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Ecom Show. I'm your host, Andrew Math, and today I'm joined by the amazing Carrie Lawrence, who is the CEO of Decile. Carrie, how you doing? You ready for a good show? I'm doing great. It's great to talk with you this morning, Andrew. Very excited to have you on the show. Thank you for joining us. Uh, as I'm sure you know, I love to do the very stereotypical thing and pretend that no one knows who you are and no one knows anything about Decile and give you a second here to kind of introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and obviously more about Decile and we'll take it from there, okay? That sounds great. Um, so yeah, so I'm Carrie. I live here in Washington, D.C., married with uh, two children. Um and Decile is a customer data and analytics platform, and it's kind of got an interesting history. Um, I was actually the co-founder of a company called Social Code, which was more of a digital performance marketing agency that we launched back in 2010. And as Social Code sort of grew and developed over time, there were components of that company that were functioning more like an agency. So there was the media business, creative business, and audio business, and then there was this little software business unit that I was running at the time. And that was where Decile was initially incubated. And then in July of 2020, so height of the start of the pandemic, um, we decided along with um, our corporate holding company, so I should mention um, owned by Graham Holdings Company, that it made more sense to actually spin Decile out into its own company. We were starting to have a lot of success in particular with more of those kind of mid-market um, e-com brands, um, your sweet spot, of course. Um, and so that was the the initial birth of Decile. So we're still wholly owned by Graham Holdings. Um, and as far as my journey, um, you could probably tell um, a sort of multiple time co-founder. Um, I like early stage things. I like building. I like um, trying to stay very close to the pulse of what's happening kind of in the ecosystem. So that's always like a piece of advice I give to everyone. It's like, no matter what your job or where you are, always try to kind of position yourself in the area that you see growing quite a bit. So, yeah. you know, if you find that you're working in a vertical or an industry or even a department within your company that doesn't seem to be where the focus or the pulse is moving, um, I always say like, it's a great idea to try to kind of position yourself there. My other Great piece of advice that I um, I should say I, I stole this from Anne Mulcahy, who's uh, she's a former CEO of Xerox, very well known uh, leader on tons of boards. And I once heard her speak, and and she talked about the importance of horizontal learning. And I think this has really stuck with me because I think so many people, especially young people starting their careers, want to just quickly move up that career lattice in the exact same kind of vein where they started and what she had sort of shared and that I also fully embrace is the idea where you should try to learn as many different things as possible. And I, I truly think that is the reason that today I'm a CEO, because when I started my career, you know, I worked at an ad agency and then when, uh, you know, I worked at a, a nonprofit, a think tank. And then um, even in the early days of social code, um, we were, you know, when we started out, we didn't have a finance team. So I, I was a business major. So they're like, okay, Carrie, you do all the accounting and stuff. So I learned the finance side of the business. Um, I did account management. I did product development. And I think that really kind of piqued my interest in wanting to build and run a technology company. Um, I did agency partnerships. I've done sales. So I think like having experience across as many different categories as possible positions you um, for, ha for having a great career and to be a good leader. Nice. So tell me a little bit more about uh, Decile. Like, how does it work? Who's using it? What are the benefits of it? Like, what are the actual, what would be reasonings people would want to use it? Yeah. Well, I think, and I should say, like, our founding mission way back in 2020 
was to help brands grow profitably. And I think it's, we laugh now because that's literally what everyone is saying now, right? There you yeah. see that huge shift. And this is a big reason for why we developed Decile initially too, is it was a response to what I saw happening in particular with the, the D2C ecosystem. Because if you think like, you know, 10, 15 years ago, there was the, you know, the, the emergence of all these early D2C brands and the great promise of, you know, lower customer acquisition costs because you could acquire customers very inexpensively at the time, you know, through like Facebook and Google, et cetera. You didn't have to have those very expensive overhead costs um, of kind of in-store. But then over time, you know, it, it be became a lot more crowded and a lot noisier and digital acquisition costs started to really rise. So our premise is that marketers should leverage what we think is their most valuable marketing asset, their first party customer data. So at Decile, effectively what we're doing is we're helping those brands to leverage their customer data. We're also enriching that data with additional kind of demographic, psychographic, and behavioral attributes to give a fuller picture of who these customers are. We're helping them to identify their highest value customers. Because what we would always say is, you know, even if you don't have a subscription offering, you want to act like you do, right? You want those repeat purchasers, those customers who are going to really drive your brand. And that's what's going to help you grow profitably. Because what, what started to happen, back to my kind of DDC story, is like people were just acquiring as many customers as possible, you know, irregardless of the cost or the long-term value of those customers. So you, even you think about like Uber and DoorDash and WeWork, like these huge companies, and then all of a sudden their business models were upside down. And so we're trying to help in particular, to your point, mid-market brands, um, provide them access to this technology that's not always readily accessible to them at an affordable price point, but that really allows them to use that first party data to build and retain a more loyal customer base, to optimize product strategies, to help them know, you know, what should be bundled together? What's that sequential purchase journey? You know, how can you be smarter about growing profitably? Um, and so I would say our sweet spot is really um, brands that are kind of, you know, in, anyone who has fast moving purchase data. So we work a lot with uh, fashion apparel brands, health and beauty, home goods, consumables, um, and typically in that kind of 10 to 200 million annual revenue space. So it's essentially helping you build out kind of a more robust uh, customer profile. Is that yeah? I mean, way I think to look that, at it. Yeah, I think that's part of it. So what, like, one easy way to think of us is like sometimes we'll say we're a CDP custom built for marketers. So as I mentioned, mm -hmm. like our roots are really in the marketing world. So we started out not just like okay, here's some analytics and insights from your data, and and, and I think less about profiles, more about cohorting by any dimension. But also, like, that's only as valuable to you if, is, is the ability to act on it. And also, so like we have automatic integrations with all the key acquisition and remarketing platforms. So we make it really easy to create those high value audiences, onboard them in the key, you know, whether it's your ESP, your SMS provider or your, you know, your acquisition platforms. Um, we have an integration with Shopify. So it's an easy way to kind of keep that data refreshing you know, on a regular cadence. Um, so I think, yeah, ultimately, like I said, you need to leverage your most valuable asset, which is that yeah. customer data. What are you seeing these different marketers and e-commerce sellers leveraging this data for? Or is it a lot of people leveraging it from an advertising perspective or, you know, setting up different campaigns? Are they using it for segmentation? Like what's the use cases of it? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And part of that depends on, kind of what their role is. So I would say when we're working with, um, let's say like a product or merchandising manager, so they want to look at the data to say, okay, like if I have a bunch of different product SKUs, I want to know like, how should I think about bundling my various products to create the best subscription offering, for instance, or um, the best way to kind of showcase those um, um, for those you know prospects or customers. If you are... Um, on the marketing side in charge of acquisition or retention, what they're really doing is, is leveraging the data to d decide, okay, here are my highest value customers or personas. So another thing that we're able to do is to not just take first party attributes. So think purchase behavior and value. So we can tell, um, you know, automatically create these AI generated personas that have all your, you know, the lifetime revenue of those, those personas the average order value, but also those softer metrics that I kind of alluded to earlier. So, you know, demographic, psychographic, behavioral. So you might say, like, for instance, 
for me, maybe a, you know, an urban mom with two kids cares about, you know, anti-aging skincare products now and like, you know, something more in that vein. Whereas um, maybe you're kind of like a hip new early adopter and you just, you know, want some other products. So like, it's important to understand that customers are different and they have different behaviors. So those developing those personas allows these on the marketer front to develop more personalized marketing campaigns and minimize waste. And when you think about it, why this is so important. So, you know, SMS marketing is a huge new, you know, I would say marketing channel that sort of really took off in 2022, right? But it's a very intimate medium. So Mm -hmm. if I'm going to get texted from a brand, like I don't want to be blasted in my very personal communication. And if I am going to get a text, I want it to be something that I've already had my eye on, something that is now on sale and that like, I'm like, okay, they know me. They, you know, it's, it's something that it truly needs my attention that I need to buy this now. Another story that, that might be interesting is um, we worked with this, um, this high end textile provider and we were looking at their data and they were always showing like their highest volume um, product is the, the first image in their marketing and their carousel. And so they continued to kind of drive a lot of volume to this particular product. But then what they noticed from looking at the data within Decile was it actually was not bringing in a high value customer over time, you know? And so what we did is we said, hey, look, your third most popular item here is actually bringing in a much higher value customer long-term. So why don't we think about starting to showcase that in your creative and see what happens? And lo and behold, they made that very slight change based on what they learn from their data and saw, you know, increased revenue of 20% quarter over quarter. So just being able to be smart about how you market. I think um, for the finance folks want to use our e-commerce reporting suite to do look at all the spaghetti charts, right? The classic, like, you know, <laughs> cohort data by any dimension. Um, so, you know, different users have different use cases. But I would say the folks that were most often, like the, the uh, like heavy users are like heads of e-com, the digital marketing folks, um, those are kind of the four main stakeholders. Interesting. So that, that example you just gave, so basically you're saying they had, was it, did you say it was like a banner on their site, right? Well, no, like I think it was, they were using like, it was like a Facebook or meta carousel ad. Is what they were leading with. Okay. Yeah. Like the first image that was shown, it was bringing in a lower value customer for them. Yeah. Interesting, but it was one of their top sellers. So basically, they were able to figure out, even though it's bringing you the volume, it's not bringing you the lifetime value. That's right. And also, in addition to bringing a higher value customer, I mean, it was when they used their third most popular item, that quickly became one of their most popular. When you're advertising that, you know, you're going to get yeah. people to start buying that. So, you know, it, it sort of fed into itself. Interesting. Okay, so basically it's helping, and all of this data, is this something that you mentioned, this is all first party data. So this is basically your pre-existing customer list that you mentioned you have an integration with Shopify. So you're able to kind of see, okay, here's all of the different cohorts of, of customer profiles that you have from people that have already purchased with you. This isn't something that is pulling in from any of the advertising channels, correct? It can, well, we, we also connect with all the data from your ad platform. So that, that also helps to provide things like our, you know, CAC reports, customer acquisition and measurement. But yeah. it, honestly, it doesn't have to be an existing customer. It could be a lead. Our system just needs some sort of match key. So that means we need to know that this is a real person because everything is resolved to individual people. So you need an email mm-hmm. address, home address, phone number. All that goes into our data integration process. All that, you know, hygiene, it gets clean, cleaned up. We're also enriching that with those third-party attributes. So we might know that, Andrew, you also, I'm obviously making this up, but you also are, love baseball and, you know, you love to go hiking. And so maybe those attributes also get appended to you. So, and again, and then it all gets anonymized when it moves into the analytics environment. So we understand you as a cohort. So Andrew as a persona is, you know, outdoorsy, male, who, you know, lives in this region and tends to like to buy these products. Interesting. So you're merging their first party data with the third party data to be able to get in more of that information about who that person potentially is so that I I mean, in my position would be the marketer so that the marketers can effectively put together more personalized campaigns and then target these audiences much better. And then also be able to focus on 
whether they're looking for increased volume, increased average order value, improved LTV, whatever direction they want to go in. That's exactly right. And the other piece that's important is then tracking that over time, right? So what's nice is every new customer, so you on the marketing side, you're acquiring every new customer, they immediately get mapped to one of those personas. And then we mm -hmm. track the volume of those over time. So one of the first kind of meeting engagements that we would typically have with a client is say like, okay, here's, here's what you're you know, your AI generated personas, these are the four main personas you have. Now, look, this is the one these, you know, let's say suburban moms are the most valuable to you, but they're not the highest volume. You want to get more of those. So we're going to push those into your platforms, maybe do a lookalike off of those personas, try to get more of those people and then see what happens over time. Are you starting to bring in that higher value um, customer? Or it's also a great way to validate validate campaign success. So if you just want to say like, hey, we're doing this whole new product launch or this brand launch, who did that bring in? You know, is it bringing in the right kind of customer? Yeah. Interesting. Okay. And so how is that tracked over time, right? Because so, like, obviously those cohorts are going to change as more data is coming in. So are you able to kind of segment out the analytics and, and decipher like, hey, this is how this cohort's been doing this is how this one's been doing and, and track that over time? Or is it more of a blended thing? Like, how does that work? Yeah, no, I mean, it all happens within our within our platform. So as I said, like, as soon as you get acquired, you get mapped to persona, and then you have these cohorts, and that data gets refreshed, you know, on a regular cadence, typically weekly mm -hmm. is what most of our clients would do. And then you can start to see, you know, how those how those customers are evolving or changing over time. But we have all of that data where is within our system. So it's, yeah. we're, you know, managing all that first party data. Interesting. Now, who would be, what type of business would be the best fit for this? Like, I would imagine you've got to have a pretty decent amount of data in order for this to really be leveraged. Like if you're, you know, a newer seller, maybe you just set up on Shopify in the past few years kind of thing might not have as much data as necessary, or is it something that it's, you it's can probably kind of figure out still? actually less than you would think. We would typically say you need about 10,000 records of data. So mm -hmm. that usually equates to someone who's maybe got annual revenues about, you know, one to $2 million nor or north of that. Um, and anywhere from, you know, we've had, you know, folks with, 200 million records of data. So it can, we can, yeah. you know, manage either. But to your point, you kind of want to have um, at least 10,000 records. We also, because of the third party enrichment piece, um, and not just the opportunity, the US based companies are, you know, the ones that can extract the most value from our system, because that third party enrichment is only for US uh, based customers. And then, um, you know, people who have several products, like if you only have a single product SKU, or, you know, you're selling to other businesses, that's not going to work as well. Because as I said, everything within Decile is based on, you know, known individual users. So the D2C mm -hmm. folks are a good fit. Yeah. Interesting. So where, what type of features are you rolling out uh, as time goes on here? What's kind of, what's the goal of where you want Decile to get to? Yeah, I think we just kind of released sort of a, a new kind of heightened version of our comparative analytics um, functionality. So there is like real time segmentation and, and comparison functionality within the platform. And what, what what's nice is that we have the benefit of having such a wide client list that we've learned like what a lot of those key use cases are. So more, yeah. I would say, out of the box um, comparative stuff, a lot more um, predictive audience. So we already have like highest propensity to purchase, as I said, like the persona. So there's a lot of modeled audiences that we're going to continue to lean mm -hmm. into. And then um, I think on the personas piece, um, as I said, we already have kind of like the source channel, the channel affinities, the product affinities, but I think also starting to look at kind of addressable universe and like under uh, giving more of that context. Yeah. So a lot of, uh, I would say, more pushing into personas and the comparative analytics. Yeah. How would that, is there a way to get it to feed into, or is there a, a, an example of like, you know, this is how this company did it or something like that, where basically they took some of this information and were able to potentially integrate it or set up some kind of automations where it personalizes the experience on their website or something along those lines. Like, so you mentioned, you know, so-and-so likes baseball. So if you're a sports, uh, let's say apparel company and you've got, baseball and football and basketball and all of them, like, is there a way to feed that data somewhere else to a point where your website starts to adjust some of the copy or adjust some of the creative so that that persona can effectively kind of start to see exactly what they're interested in? 
Yeah. And I mean, I think you're the bigger point that you're making, which is a good one is like, you've got to be able to integrate with current workflows, right? Or no one's going to want to adopt all this stuff. And so that is why, so we sit also on Snowflake. We're integrated with Snowflake. And a lot of these, you know, you see merchants are also starting to use Snowflake as a data warehouse. So that makes it really easy to have these assets be portable. So if they say, look, we want to kind of live within our own system, but we want those personas that you've built. Like, you know, you sync those into our system. Yes. As I said, we are, we also have API integrations with, any of the ad platforms that accept ID level data and this, I'll get to your website. Yeah. This is important because again, everything is like, we truly believe. And I personally, like the world is moving towards identity based marketing. Right. So mm-hmm. we, we can integrate with, you know, with Google analytics and we do have the web analytics that pull through. Um, I would say that, but more identity based integrations are kind of where we're focused. Same thing. So with attentive and Clavio or two others that we have automated integrations that make it very easy to kind of take Beautiful. those, segments and audiences and port those over. Yeah. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Carrie, thank you so much for being on the show. Really appreciate it. I don't want to take up too much of your time today, but obviously great information. Super cool. I'm going to dig into it a little bit more because I've got a couple of clients that this will be great for. Um, But thank you so much. I'd love to give the opportunity here to let everyone know where they can find out obviously more about you and more about Desile. Yeah. Thanks so much, Andrew. This has been a lot of fun. Um, so you can reach out to me directly. It's Carrie, C-A-R-Y at decile.com. So would love to hear from everyone. And um, our website is decile.com. Thanks so much. Beautiful. Carrie, thank you so much. Obviously, everyone who tuned in, thank you as well. Per usual, rate, review, subscribe, all that fun stuff, or head over to ecomshow.com to check out all of our previous episodes. But per usual, thank you all for joining and we'll see you all next time. Have a good one. Thank you for tuning in to the Ecom Show. Head over to ecomshow.com to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform or on the Blue Tusker YouTube channel. The Ecom Show is brought to you by Blue Tusker, a full service digital marketing company specifically for e commerce sellers looking to accelerate their growth. Go to bluetusker.com now for more information. Make sure to tune in next week for another amazing episode of the Ecom Show.